Hello, this is Edward Tamesian, and today I'm going to be interviewing the legendary Dr. William Lane Craig. And to give a brief introduction to this excellent gentleman, William Lane Craig is visiting scholar of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology and professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. He and his wife, Jan, have two grown children. At the age of 16, as a junior in high school, he first heard the message of the Christian gospel and yielded his life to Christ. Dr. Craig pursued his undergraduate studies at Wheaton College, BA in 1971, and graduate studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, MA in 1974, MA in 1975 as well, the University of Birmingham, England, where he got his PhD in 1977, and the University of Munich, Germany with a doctrine in theology in 1984. From 1980 to 86, he taught philosophy of religion at Trinity, during which time he and Jan started their family. In 1987, they moved to Brussels, Belgium, where Dr. Craig pursued research at the University of Louvain until assuming his position at Talbot in 1994. And he's uh, a well-renowned uh, published author. He has over 30 books. And um, you can check out his site at reasonablefaith.com. And before we get into the question, sir, did you want anything you wanted to say real quick? Well, just to be uh, happy to be with you, Edward. And I would correct that web address. It's reasonablefaith.org. Oh, at .org. .org. Okay. Dot .com. Awesome. All righty. So we got that. Awesome. All right. So for our first question, um, briefly, could you summarize the chief goal of the Kalam Cosmological Argument. I guess tell us what it is, and then you can go on from there. Oh, well, to tell you what it is, this is a very ancient version of the cosmological argument that has been defended by uh, Muslims, Jews, and Christians, both Protestants and Catholic alike. Mm -hmm. And it consists of three very simple steps. Uh, one, whatever begins to exist has a cause, Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. And then you do a conceptual analysis of what it is to be a cause of the universe and a number of very striking theologically significant properties come out of that analysis. So the purpose of the argument, or the aim of the argument as you put it, is to make it plausible that God exists by demonstrating that there is an absolutely first, uncaused, immaterial, spaceless, timeless, um, personal creator of the universe of enormous power and intelligence. Okay, thank you very much. That was a good summary. And then um, for our next question, what would you say is the chief criticism of the Kalam cosmological argument, and then what would you respond with? Well, by chief criticism, let me um, describe what I would say substantive criticisms. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I don't think that the first premise, whatever begins to exist, is really susceptible to significant criticism. The idea okay. that anything, and in particular the entire universe, could just spring into being and caused out of nothing is, I think, uh, just metaphysically absurd. Mm -hmm. So the controversial premise in the argument is the second one, that the universe began to exist. And I offer both philosophical arguments and scientific confirmation of this premise. Now, in response to the first philosophical argument based upon the impossibility of an actually infinite number of things, I think the most substantive response would be to simply say that that's the nature of the actual infinite. It's bizarre. Mm -hmm. it, it is strange. And just bite the bullet and accept these <laughs> consequences. And my response to that, I guess, is that I'm kind of a common sense uh, sort of guy. And I just do not believe that things like a Hilbert's Hotel oh, or yeah, Bernadette's book where you have an infinite number of pages in the book with no last page that the and and on and on the grim reaper paradox that these sorts of things i don't think they're possible okay. in reality now the second um argument for the finitude of the past is based upon the impossibility of completing an actually infinite number of things by successively adding one member after another and I think here the important and substantive criticism of this argument would be to deny 
the dynamic or tensed theory of time, which okay. presupposes that temporal becoming is an objective feature of reality. Rather, one would defend a tenseless or static theory of time, according to which the universe began to exist only in the sense that a yardstick uh, begins okay. to exist. But obviously, a yardstick doesn't come into being at the first inch or the, the first quarter inch or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so in response to that, I've done my philosophical duty and published two um, scholarly books uh -huh. uh, on the theory of time, defending a tense theory of time and uh, offering objections and refutation of a tenseless theory of time. Now, with respect to the scientific confirmations from the expansion of the universe and from the thermodynamic properties of the universe, there I think the evidence is very clear. Um, Alex Vilenkin, a very prominent cosmologist at Tufts University, says there are no tenable models of a beginningless universe, a past eternal universe. So I think that all that the critic can say here is that science is provisional, it's tentative, maybe these finds will be overturned in the future, uh -oh. and somehow the eternity of the past restored. And to that, I think the quite proper response is that we have no choice but to go on the basis of the scientific evidence as we currently have it, uh, and that the scientific evidence we have is certainly strong and um, stable enough to warrant the conclusion that the universe is not infinite in the past. So those would be the most substantive criticisms of the argument and the ways in which I would respond to them. Awesome. Thank you very much. All righty. Mm -hmm. And for our other question, what is the difference between the deotheistic view regarding Jesus and the monotheistic view? And why do you subscribe to the latter, the monotheistic view? Okay. Can I ask a question, Edward? I was very surprised to see this question coming from you. What? Why are you interested in this topic? Oh, I am because um, I've seen a lot of debates on this. And um, I remember watching, I'm sure you know who Dr. James White is from Alpha and Omega oh, yes. Ministries. Yeah, so he's debated um, a couple of Catholic priests. And uh, to, just to, to make a long story short, they always like to get on him on going on the Bible alone. They're like, you know, the two natures oh. and two wills of Christ. Where'd you get this idea from? It's not from the scriptures. And then, like, you know, right. like all the, these things. Yeah. And then, like, he like he always brings it up and str and then, you know, stresses that, you know, he had two natures and two wills. And the Catholics are like, yeah, I agree, because anything else would be heresy or whatever. And I just thought it was interesting because some people think he has one, like two natures, but one will and stuff. So, yeah. So I got interested. Yeah. Very interesting. OK, well, yeah. um Diophilitism is the view that Christ has two wills, a human will and a divine will. Monothelitism is the view that Christ has just one will. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I think monothelitism is the more plausible view is that I think that wills are associated with persons, okay. not with natures. Natures don't have wills. If they did, then I think you would have two persons in Christ, a human person and a divine person, and that would fall into the heresy called Nestorianism. Mm -hmm. Rather, it seems to me that it is a person who has a will, and since there is one person who, who Christ is, uh, it follows that there is one will in Christ. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Of course, you know, no one knows what it's like to have two natures and, you know, wh whether that can be right. only one will or two wills. That's something, you know, <laughs> we just got to throw up. Right. So did you see that movie a few years ago? Uh, I can't remember the one. It's where it features a crippled astronaut named, I think, Jake, who remains in the spaceship while he becomes incarnate on the planet as a kind of nephi, uh, extraterrestrial being with a blue body and alien features. And I thought this was a beautiful illustration of the incarnation, how you could have one person who had a human nature and a nephi nature uh, and endowed with very different properties. The one was crippled, weak, and infirm. The other was powerful and 
becomes the savior of the Nephi race on that okay. planet, interestingly enough. So I, I think that <laughs> this he was a Christ figure in that okay. movie and does provide a kind of nice illustration of how one person could have two natures. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. All righty. Mm. And then for our next question, um, would you say that John Calvin's system of divine determinism with Jonathan Edwards later expanding upon it, do you think that it makes God the efficient cause of sin or author of evil? Yes, I do. And this was the subject of a dialogue that I just had with the man you mentioned a moment ago, James White. Oh, interesting. On Justin Brierley's podcast, Unbelievable. Oh. Uh, Justin asked us to address the question, of which view does a better job of solving the problem of evil, mm -hmm. Calvinism or Molinism? Molinism yep. uh, and I argued that while they may be equivalent with regard to natural evil, that is to say non-moral evil, that with respect to moral evil, the Calvinist view uh, makes God the author of sin because it is God who determines how people will choose in any circumstances in which he might place them. And so it seems to me that it inevitably makes God the cause of people sinning. Uh, and insofar as it's evil to do such a thing, it makes God himself evil, which is just unconscionable. <laughs> so I, I think that the Molinist view, which affirms libertarian, libertarian free will, will okay. is a better view. Awesome. Yeah. And like, just to comment on that, um, I actually wrote a paper that got published and I mentioned you in it too. Uh, it was oh. a scholarly paper, got it passed peer review and it got accepted. So it was, it was nice that it did. And then, um, just very, very briefly, I mentioned that, um, cause in, uh, compatibilism, which Calvinists are, determinists are, you can only go yeah. off of your strongest desire. And it's like, if God's not giving you libertarian freedom, it's like, it's like, yeah, you're the one willingly doing it, but it's like, he's kind of, restricting your choices you know what i mean if you only can go on your greatest inclination so yeah yeah it's much worse than restricting he actually determines yep. it Efficient uh, it's calls, a thoroughgoing yeah. divine determinism mm -hmm. and then yeah all righty so that was a very good answer to the question all righty for our next question what do you say is theistic um evolution how would you describe theistic evolution and do you think it is biblically compatible with the account in genesis I guess I would say that theistic evolution would be the view that God creates biological complexity on this planet through the mechanisms and processes that are described in standard evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. So that God is ultimately behind it, okay. but that science gives an accurate description of the series of secondary causes. Now, I don't think theistic evolution excludes that God might intervene at particular points in the okay, process to, right. to do something miraculously, but basically it would accept the explanatory mechanisms that are postulated by um, contemporary evolutionary biology. And I think that once you give up the view that Genesis 1 teaches that the world was created in six consecutive 24-hour days, mm -hmm. that it's striking that it does not say anything about how God mm -hmm. created the plants and animals. In fact, when God creates the plants on the third day, it's very striking. God doesn't say, let there be vegetation and fruit trees on the earth. Yeah, and true. It would go. What it says is, let the earth bring forth vegetation and fruit trees bearing fruit after the kind. And it was so the earth brought forth these things. And similarly for the animals, the earth brought them forth. Mm -hmm. So I think there's already an intimation there by the author that God's creation of these plants and animals is fully compatible with identifying natural um, secondary causes uh -huh. that are involved in their development and origin. Awesome. All right. Well, that was a good little summary. Thank you for that, Dr. Craig. And then uh, for our final question, um, do you believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life? And if so, what would you say is the greatest proof for it? Well, I don't believe in it, but on the other hand, I don't disbelieve okay. it. I, see either, saying, Edward. Yeah. I, I would take a position of just non-belief. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether there is uh, extraterrestrial life. Um, I know that evolutionary biologists do say 
that the evolution of intelligent uh, life comparable to that on Earth is so enormously improbable that it's unlikely to exist anywhere else in the observable cosmos. We are likely alone in terms of intelligent life. Now, that doesn't exclude there can be slime molds or something on other planets <laughs> elsewhere in the universe, but in the universe as we know it, um, it seems to be a consensus among evolutionary biologists that the evolution of carbon-based life capable of the information processing that we're able to do is just so improbable it wouldn't have arisen twice. Gotcha. All righty. Well, thank you very much for that, Dr. Craig. Those are good answers to those questions. And uh, I feel like I'm meeting Elvis today. I'm really excited. This is the best interview I've done ever. So thank, thank you for being on. <laughs> Well, certainly, Edward. I'm glad you invited me. Yeah, and then uh, before we close off, um, did you want any to pub, like promote any books of yours, any works? Uh, do you have any other talks you'd like well, to talk no, about? No, except just to inform your listeners that my current project is uh, writing a systematic philosophical theology. I'm right. anticipating that this will take me five to ten years to complete, wow. uh, but I am now nearing the end of volume one, which will deal with the subjects of uh, introduction to systematic philosophical theology, faith, scripture, and the doctrine of God. What is God like? So it's a, a very critical volume. I have learned a tremendous amount in writing it. It has been much more than just a summary of my life's work. I'm really breaking new ground here. And so I'm very excited about the work on this projected systematic philosophical theology. All righty. Well, thank you again, Dr. Craig. And I want to thank Michael Lapine back there for recording this. I really appreciate y'all making time for me. Certainly. And uh, you have a Merry Christmas. Yes, you too.